worship at First United Methodist Church in Seymour, Indiana. Um, worship is coming to you from every place but the sanctuary at, uh, at First Church in Seymour this morning. Uh, thanks to the uh, sleet and ice on the roads, uh, we, uh, we're coming from a variety of places. Uh, I'm coming from my home. Bill and Libby Pulsar are coming from their home. My daughter, Kristen, is managing all of this. Uh, again, I, I called Judy this morning and said, uh, uh, no music this morning in the sanctuary. You can go back, back to bed. And she laughed and, and of course, uh, was already up. And, and, and uh, So anyway, so welcome to worship this morning. Uh, Pastor Rick Bell, glad to welcome you uh, this morning. We, uh, uh, we're busy uh, gathering ourselves for, uh, for this next uh, week of Epiphany. We're in the, uh, the third Sunday after Epiphany. This is January the 24th, and uh, it's good to uh, welcome all of you uh, here this morning. I think the, the midweek uh, has carried uh, a number of uh, notes that are worth taking a look at, uh, grateful for our mission possible pro projects, and uh, as you probably saw in the midweek, there was a very, a very fine note from the daughter of one of the ladies who uh, goes to the uh, uh, center across the street uh, and uh, thanking us for the uh, uh, effort that we're putting in there at the dialysis center and uh, and how it touched her mother and uh, indeed it just simply says is that we are finding ways to put uh, put Christ into the hearts and lives of people around us and so thank you thank you to uh, uh, to Mike Birch for heading up that project and uh, I trust that all of you will continue to support him with uh, with items uh, for that project I'm looking forward to other um, emerging uh, mission projects this spring. So put on your thinking caps. Be aware of how you can be reaching out and touching uh, folks uh, in your neighborhood, uh, in the city, and around the world. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this morning we have um, an important announcement to make. Uh, our staff parish committee has been working with Russ Abel, our conference superintendent, and uh, uh, they have uh, they have uh, reached an acceptance of a new pastor, and uh, so I'll be turning to Bill Colazar uh, and uh, as our chairperson of staff parish, and allowing him to make uh, make the full announcement. So, Bill, uh, tell us. Uh, Tell us about our new pastor. Good morning. I'm pleased to announce that Bishop Trimble has made an appointment for our new senior pastor. Effective July 1st, Reverend Teresa Poole will be our new pastor. She's currently serving at Milroy United Methodist Church, which is, uh, if you don't know where that is, it's uh, north of Greensburg and south of Rushville. The staff parish committee met with Pastor Teresa and her husband, Rick, last week. And I'd like to let you know that she's a very energetic, enthusiastic person whose passions are children and are making disciples. We're excited to have Teresa and Rick join us, so please pray for them in this time of transition. Please join me now in thanking God for Pastor Teresa and also for Pastor Rick's ministry here at the First United Methodist Church. Almighty God, we thank you for our newly appointed pastor, Reverend Teresa. Help us to receive her and her family with open hearts and open minds. We also thank you for Pastor Rick and his family for their faithful ministry to our congregation. Please pour out your blessings of health, joy, peace, and safety upon them. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we come to our call to worship this morning, and I'm pleased to uh, 
welcome Libby Colazar as our liturgist. And so Libby will, uh, this is, our, our call to worship is from Psalm 62. Uh, let's share these words with our faith family. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God. God is a refuge for us. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this. That power belongs to God, and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord. Hear our gathering prayer this morning. Everlasting God, you gave us the faith of Christ for a light to our feet amid the darkness of this world. Have pity on all who, by doubting or denying it, are gone astray from the path of safety. Bring home the truth to unbelieving hearts and minds, and grant them to receive your truth. It is with this prayer in our hearts that we now gather before you, Holy Lord, as the faith family of First United Methodist Church of Seymour. Amen. So this morning, uh, in lieu of uh, our regular music folks, I've, uh, uh, I've asked my grandson Richard if he would uh, play Amazing Grace on his violin. Richard, it will enjoy. Thank you. So, boys and girls, it's time for our children's time this morning. Uh, so gather around, and uh, uh, the, the uh, question that we're working on this morning is, how do you eat a sandwich? How do you eat a sandwich? Oh, my goodness. So as we come to this, let's uh, say together with me, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Okay, so how do you eat a sandwich? So I've picked up a, I've got a, I've got a paper sandwich here. Uh, the question is, how do you eat it? So let's see, we've got... <laughs> We've got two pieces of bread, and we're going to put them together, okay? And so now the question is, how do we eat it? Do we eat it from the corner? Do we eat it in the middle? Or do we tear it again, or cut it, and eat it from the middle? Now remember, this is crust, 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 crust. Ah, so, so the question is, do you like eating crust? How many like eating crust? If you like eating crust, say yes. If you don't like eating crust, say no. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, I, they must make crust harder than they used to because when I was a kid, there wasn't any issue. 
you got a piece of bread and they made a sandwich out of it. You just ate it. That was just the way it was. But I'll tell you what, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, once you got into the middle of it, ooh, that's where all the gooey stuff was really there. And that was really good. I like getting into the middle of the sandwich. I, what about you? Yeah? Well, you know, as we grow older, um, we eat sandwiches differently. Uh, when we're little, we have to tear it. We have to get little sandwiches so that we can eat so that they're not too big. But when we're older, we can eat bigger sandwiches. We don't have to tear it. We don't have to cut them in pieces. We can eat the whole big sandwich at once. Ah. <laughs> so how do you eat a sandwich? You know, when we first start eating sandwiches, I bet your moms and dads cut off the cr crusts around the edge, don't you think? But after a while, you're big enough, you can, you can kind of chomp down on that crust. Things change. The bigger we get, the more we grow, the more life changes. We don't have to eat a sandwich the same way that we did when we were two years old, three years old, four years old. Now that we're eight years old, 10 years old, 14 years old, 20 years old, we can eat sandwiches differently. How do you eat your sandwich? <laughs> so let's pray together. Put your hands together and say with me, dear God, thank you for today, for taking care of me, for giving me food like a sandwich. Thank you, God. Take care of all the boys and girls all around the world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. It's been good to be with you this morning. Here are our offertory prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We present this offering to you, O Lord. Please now take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. May it be a great blessing to many. All of this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture comes from Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 21. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishing. And Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. The second scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 through 31. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Um. Well, thank you, Liz, for, uh, uh, for reading scripture this morning for us. That's always nicely done. And so as we hear these ancient words and, uh, and reflect on the meaning for our lives, let us pray together. Gracious and holy God, 
help us to hear and understand what has been written and what is the deeper message behind the words so that we might truly become your disciples. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. And so we have been talking about Epiphany, and what we've seen so far is that uh, following the birth of Jesus, of God's activity of holy mystery bringing Jesus into the world, then uh, we experience uh, that the whole world now needs to become aware of this uh, holy, uh, holy moment, this incarnation, the God breaking into our midst. And so it is that, uh, that our scriptures tell us uh, that the heavens were, were literally torn in two uh, and, and they continued to be open as God continued to make manifest, to make known holy mystery, to help us answer the question, what must I do in order to be in right relationship with God? What is it that I must do? What, who am I to be? How must I live my life? That's the question, always the question that we ask ourselves. And so, uh, so far we have heard that God continues to, uh, to open up the understandings and the possibilities for us to hear and to understand. But now this morning, our scripture takes us away from God's specific activities of opening up the heavens and bringing us full front in, in confrontation with Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Jesus becomes, is becoming the, the, um, uh, the incarnational reality of God in our midst. And so it is now in this epiphany moment, this aha moment, God wants us to look at Jesus and say, oh, oh yes. And so we hear in Mark's gospel this morning as Jesus is making his way uh, around the Sea of Galilee, how he calls his first disciples. And the response that Mark tells us is that immediately, immediately they respond. You know, this is really a fascinating you know, they didn't say, well, gosh, let's get together and have a council meeting. Uh, let me go home and talk with the brothers and sisters and the folks about this. Uh, instead, what Mark says is that there's an immediate response uh, to Jesus' invitation so that the aha moment, the moment of, of realization of God's presence, activity in their midst uh, becomes an immediate response in which they literally walked away from their nets and followed him. And so it is that Mark makes it clear that, that as we walk into the epiphany moment, we experience this Jesus who asks from us an immediate response. An immediate response. When we look at Paul's writing in Corinthians, uh, we hear uh, something of the response that Paul visioned uh, in, in, as he encountered the, uh, the resurrected Jesus. And so what Paul is saying in, in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians is, is, that, is that whatever has to do with this world is passing away. And, that, and so he talk, talks about, you know, if you, if you have a wife, don't worry about, don't worry about, about that relationship, if you have kids, if you have, if you are in mourning, if you are rejoicing, if you're out to buy things, if you're, whatever you're doing in the world, it simply isn't paramount any longer. It doesn't carry the, the, the immediate attention for your immediate attention is on the reality that the present form of this world is passing away. Now, of course, that's what's happening as we look at Mark and, and see Jesus' activity, we see the, the actual Jesus moments in which, in which the, the, the former world is passing away as Jesus begins to call and collect uh, his disciples and to begin to build a new reality, a new relational vision, all of which requires an immediate response. 
you know, one of the things that we have trouble with today is immediate responses. You know, we live in a world in which we have so many possibilities that, uh, uh, that we tend to um, want to hedge our bets. One of the things that uh, we talk about in, in church life is, is that it's hard to get people to, uh, to commit to a project that's more than just a couple of months, sometimes even just a one-time shot, um, because, uh, because to commit yourself for, uh, for a period of time, for a number of months, for a whole year, is, uh, is just impossible because, gosh, there might be other opportunities that come along that are just that much more exciting and interesting, and, and we don't want to tie ourselves down. We, we want to keep our options open. We want to hedge our bets. Um, but in this case, in this journey of epiphany, in this coming into God moment, that's not possible. It's either yes or no. It's either I'm in or I'm not in. It's either I am a disciple or, or I'm not a disciple. It's either I believe or I don't believe. There are not a variety of options for us. We simply must respond. And so it is that, um, that we hear in the scriptures this immediate response, this new call to a new reality. Life is changing. And in fact, as the early disciples gathered together, that's exactly what happened. They came together forming new relationships and, and making new commitments to each other so that they would, could be about the process of building a new vision of life. You know, we've been living through some tumultuous times in a variety of ways in these recent days. We've, uh, we've certainly been dealing with the pandemic and uh, viral uh, issues, and, uh, and, and we're, we're ready for, certainly ready for that to come to a close. We'd like for that to come to an end. And, and in fact, a number of people have, have made enormous commitments to, to work in increased time spans to, uh, to bring about a, a vaccination process that will allow us to, uh, uh, to transform from being captive to a coronavirus to becoming, uh, to becoming one who can live beyond the, the, the limits of coronavirus. Uh, you know, the number of deaths that uh, are occurring because of this virus just continue to astound us as we push on towards a half million uh, and it's uh, it's tragic and it's sad and yet we're finding ways to build beyond that through a through a radical commitment we're we're, we're living in times of making radical commitments in the same way politically we've been certainly been tried and pushed um, you know it uh, it, it, it's difficult to look at the at, at, at the the confusion uh, and the uh, anger and the distrust that has swirled through our uh, through our country in these last months, and how we're called to to find a new sense of wholeness and unity. How how we must. How we must come together. It's not a matter of saying, well, maybe I, I'll think about it. Either we're going to make that commitment or we're not going to make that commitment. Either we're going to continue to be who we once were or we're going to become a new person and to become uh, the one who can, who can bring about a, a new vision and a new opportunity for, for this country and for the whole world that we live in. Uh, we have opportunities, but it means making radical commitments. I know as, um, as we look at, at, at all of this, uh, and, and, and I listen to the, to the political discussions on, on both sides of the conversation, uh, we need to find ways to, uh, to not get caught up in, in attacking each other. You know, there's, there's no one on either side of the conversation that truly wants to I wants to destroy this country. And so if we don't want to destroy it, then we want to build it. 
And so we need to stop pointing fingers at each other and saying, oh, you this or oh, you that. We need to start saying, let's work together. And so we need to do that. We need to make new, radical, immediate commitments. God calls us to make immediate commitments. And the first immediate commitment that God asks of us is that we accept the reality of the risen Jesus, God's incarnate presence in our midst, showing us how to live with love and grace and forgiveness and care to love ourselves, to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, and to not give in to destructive behavior. It's up to us to make immediate, immediate commitment to this reality. And so our gospel lesson calls us to this reality. And our and Paul's writing to Corinth reminds us that if we continue to simply live in this world and get caught up in just focusing on this world with all of its half-truths and, 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 and opinions, that we'll simply get bogged down into nothingness. Only as we make a clear commitment to God's grace through Jesus Christ will we be able to live forward. And so the epiphany moment, this aha moment, do you, do you actually accept this risen Jesus as God's incarnate word, as God's living word in our midst? Can you accept that reality and can you become can you become a true disciple of Jesus? Can you live beyond the claims of these moments of viral infection, of political chaos? Can you live beyond these moments into the reality of being an authentic disciple of Jesus? Can you allow your life to journey there? And if you can, then what happens is that you'll wear your masks, you'll keep your distancing, you'll take care of yourself and you'll take care of others because that's what God asks of us, to love ourselves and to love others. And when it comes to the political conversation, we'll quit pointing fingers, we'll quit being destructive, we'll quit using labels like socialism, communism, we'll stop talking about about, oh, they're trying to get rid of the police. Oh, they're just trying to, they're just trying to uh, uh, do us all in. We'll stop, we'll stop this horrible language and we'll start caring about each other. You know, we've got a lot of hurting people, not only from the virus, but from the economic crises. And we need to care for each other. We need to move forward. We need to stop trying to see what, I can get and we can and we need to start saying what can I give what can I offer how can I be a part of God's world that's what Jesus is asking us as Jesus called his disciples he called them to begin to build a new world vision a new world order and it isn't what we have been living in these recent years we need to come forward we need to step out. We need to become God's people. We need to allow the epiphany moment, the aha moment of realizing that Jesus calls and claims us. We need to allow that to simply take a hold of us and bind us into a new reality, into a new world vision. Amen and amen. And so let us come to moments of prayer, the prayer hymn that Judy chose for us today. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, till all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. And so gracious God, these powerful words of him lead us into moments with you. Hear us as we gather in your presence. We are your children. We are, the, we are your creation. We are the very essence of your spirit. You call us to be and may 
raising incredible children. And so God, help us. Forgive us for the moments of failure. Forgive us when we fall away. Forgive us when we intentionally think that we know better than you. Reclaim us yet again. We give you thanks for gathering us in. We pray that you would continue to be with those who, um, who work hard to, uh, to fight the viruses of life, whether it's the coronavirus or the viruses that cause us to, uh, to be unkind to each other, to be distrustful of each other. Help us live beyond those moments so that we can truly be and reflect your presence and your spirit. We would pray for loved ones, as always. We name them in our hearts, and we, and we name them aloud as we, uh, as we think about uh, Greg Hubbard and Larry Kemling, Jason Smallwood and John Moore. Billy Winton and Mitzi Durham, and all the others who have moments of health that uh, push them and confront them. Continue to pour your blessing upon them. We pray for your healing grace. We pray for our country in the midst of the chaos that we have created for ourselves. We hear the call that we must come together. Help us to do that. It's not an idle call. It's the call of reality. It's your call. It's the call that you intended for us to hear. So God, help us. Help us to come together. We pray for your strength and guidance for, for our new president, as vice president, as they make their way in leadership. In these early days, we pray for your grace and your blessing on those who have, who have now stepped aside, that they would find a place of peace and rest for the work that they have now left behind. And so, God, we pray for, for our country, for our people. We pray for our own lives. We lift this all in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together by saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And so as we come to the close of our worship, um, I, I do want to uh, note that um, uh, Jim and Sharon Aker, 60th wedding anniversary, uh, being celebrated with flowers in the sanctuary by their children and grandchildren. And so uh, Jim and Sharon, happy anniversary, and we'll see that those flowers are delivered to you uh, from the sanctuary. And... Uh, also would want to note that, uh, that Don Hill, uh, celebrating his 90th birthday the other day. And so Don, you've got more writings to do now because you certainly have much more reflection after, uh, after this time. So looking forward to hearing from you and, uh, and certainly we'll keep, uh, Teresa Poole, our new pastor in our love and prayers, and, and we'll, uh, we'll be sharing more information. Uh, in the midweek and in the days to come as, as she begins to make her presence known. But remember, she's still serving uh, serving her, her own church at this point. And so, um, but anyway, we'll, we'll help her and help you get to know each other. Our closing hymn that Judy chose for us, Here I Am, Lord. Uh, the opening verse says, I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, 
I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. And so may God, who comes to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, sustainer, bless, preserve, and keep each and every one of us surely this day and even forevermore. And all of God's people said in their hearts, amen and amen.